So today, the 18th of uh, April 2020, we had a webinar uh, by Dr. Uh, Abu Shala and uh, Dr. Uh, Hawa, including myself, on uh, uh, whether we should anticoagulate uh, our patients with uh, COVID-19 or not. Uh, the webinar uh, recording is available on our ICU channel on YouTube. But I thought I would give you a summary of the studies that we discussed uh, uh, on this webinar. So I'm going to present the coagulation abnormalities in COVID-19 cases. And as you all know, that we've seen many cases that have increased D-dimers. Fibrinogen is increased. Fibrinogen is increased in addition to a prolongation of PT, BTT, and INR to a variable degree. We have not seen much of thrombocytopenias, but uh, they've been reported to be uh, on the low side. We believe that there is inflammation-driven increase in fibrinogen, in addition to virus-induced endothelial damage that both are responsible for the increased coagulation in these patients. The first study that uh, was uh, uh, published, uh, I think it is available as a preprint uh, on patients uh, who were diagnosed with COVID-19 in Wuhan. They looked at uh, the D-dimers level uh, associated with mortality, and they found that patients who did not survive had a much higher D-dimer levels compared to patients who survived. In addition, older age and SOFA scores were also associated with increased mortality. In another study that was published in The Lancet, uh, they looked at 183 patients with confirmed pneumonia. 11% of them died, and they looked retrospectively at uh, the coagulation parameters, including platelets, D-dimers, fibrinogen, PT, and they looked at the DIC score of five or more. What they were able to find that the PT was more prolonged in non-survivors compared to survivors. Similarly, D-dimers were higher and fibrinogen, fibrinogen degradation products were much higher compared to non-survivors. With all this, uh, were associated with statistical significance. Surprisingly, though, the fibrinogen was slightly elevated compared to survivors, slightly elevated in non survivors compared to survivors, and no statistical significance. When they looked at uh, the DIC score as per the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis, looking at the platelets count, D-dimers, fibrinogen, and prolongation of BT, they found that 71.4% of patients who did not survive fulfilled the criteria for uh, DIC with total points of five or more as per this criteria. And when they looked at the D-dimers, you can see that there was separation between non-survivors and survivors, mainly start, started on day number four, more pronounced on day number uh, seven. And you can see how the D-dimers uh, levels uh, were much higher in non-survivors compared to survivors. Now, in a study that will be published in the intensive care medicine by uh, a French group uh, looking at uh, those patients in a multicenter uh, prospective cohort study, what they were able to find that uh, thrombotic complications were much higher in what they called COVID-19 ARDS patients, and they had a total of 150 patients in uh, this study. They compared this with historical controls, 
of non-COVID-19 ARDS of total of 233 patients. What they reported is that 64 out of 150 uh, patients had uh, thrombotic complications. That is a percentage of 42%. However, when I looked carefully in the table that they presented, I was able to count only 27, 28, 30, 32, 35 events only. So total uh, events were probably not more than uh, 25 to uh, 26 percent uh, of cases. Anyhow, this needs to be verified because I could not find uh, 64 cases they're talking about. And here they say that total of 27 cases, but this does not add up. Anyhow, there is an increased rate of thrombotic complications, uh, at least 25 uh, to probably 40% of those patients who had thrombotic complications. This is a preprint uh, only. The study, as I said, will be uh, reviewed and published in the intensive care medicine. What is confirmed in this study that they had much more pulmonary embolisms uh, cases compared to uh, non-COVID patients. A rate of 16.7% compared to 1.3%. This is 15 times higher in uh, COVID-19 ARDS compared to non-COVID-19 ARDS. Similarly, uh, CVAs were much higher, three times higher, in COVID-19 ARDS compared to non-COVID-19 ARDS. The D-dimers uh, uh, were elevated in more than 95%. They had a high rate of fibrinogen also, but they did not uh, uh, find that those patients meet the criteria of DIC altogether in 96% of the cases. Surprisingly and puzzling that those patients had a very high, uh, or in this study, they had a very high rate of lupus anticoagulant titers. The uh, uh, number of uh, renal replacement uh, therapy filters per dialyzed patients were much higher clotted in patients with COVID-19 compared to what it is known in non-COVID-19 ARDS. And we've seen this actually in multiple uh, uh, cases in our practices, that the circuits are clotting very easily and we had to change the uh, vas cath or the quinton catheters for those patients uh, on, many, on many occasions. The ECMO oxygenator uh, also is thrombosed at higher rate than what we know uh, in other uh, patients. So, so this needs to be reviewed. Uh, Actually, this is interesting also because they uh, had a propensity matched uh, 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 analysis uh, where they uh, matched uh, those patients uh, from two groups uh, and they ended up with 77 uh, patients in the COVID-19 and uh, 145 in uh, the non-COVID-19 ARDS. Still, uh, with this uh, analysis, the after matching, they had a much higher rate of pulmonary embolism in COVID-19 ARDS compared to non-COVID-19 ARDS. This is six times higher in uh, COVID-19 than in other uh, patients. We also have uh, autopsy reports uh, showing us that uh, uh, there's a high rate of uh, of uh, thrombosis uh, in this uh, study. Uh, I think it's from New Orleans. They looked at uh, more than 5,000 cases, 1,355 hospitalizations, 239 deaths with a case fatality ratio of 5%. And death uh, among hospitalized patients was the highest in the nation, 18%. In this study, they looked at uh, four patients uh, whom they did autopsies on. Uh, they were all African-American with hypertension and obesity. Majority had uh, diabetes mellitus 
elevated ferritin and elevated D dimers. What you can see here is uh, in the lungs there are bilateral pulmonary edema and patches of uh, of uh, dark hemorrhages. Uh, on the right side here, let me change the marker. On the right side here, you can see areas of uh, uh, of uh, thrombosis uh, in the lungs. Uh, another area here, and you can see uh, small areas of uh, thrombosis here, and this area here. The uh, heart, uh, you can see right-sided uh, dilatation, and you can see the D shape of the right ventricle indicating an increased uh, pulmonary uh, artery pressures. Uh, pathology uh, report uh, or uh, microscopic findings were uh, mainly associated with uh, fibrin thrombi present within distended small uh, vessels and capillaries. There is a thrombotic microangiopathy that was mainly restricted to, to the lungs. Now, this is the study that shows relationship between anticoagulant uh, therapy and uh, mortality outcome. Uh, this is uh, a study that is accepted uh, in the Journal of uh, Thrombosis and Hemostasis, uh, first published uh, on uh, March 27th, uh, 2020. And uh, let me get my... I lost my mark pointer here. Okay, so let me get uh, the pointer. Okay, and in this study, what uh, they looked at is the uh, uh, sepsis induced coagulopathy score. And this score is uh, formulated uh, by looking at the platelets count, the PT INR, and the SOFA score. So if you have a platelet of between uh, 100 and 150, you get one point, less than 100, two points. For uh, uh, INR, if it was between 1.2 to 1.4, one point, more than 1.4, it's two points. And SOFA score, uh, if it was one, one point, and for anything two or more, you would get two points. And uh, total score, uh, for uh, sepsis-induced coagulopathy has to be four or more. And this is by the International Society on Thrombosis and Hemostasis. So in this study, when they looked at uh, the uh, outcome, and we're looking at 28-day mortality outcome here, for those patients who were treated with heparin versus patients who were not treated with heparin or they were on heparin less than seven days. Initially, when they put everything together, there was no difference in mortality. However, when they looked at those patients who had sepsis-induced coagulopathy score of four or more, and there were 97 in this uh, study, they had a mortality rate of 40% on heparin compared to 64.2% with uh, in patients who were not treated with heparin. If they looked at the score less than four, uh, it was, there's a mistake here, it should be four or more, here is less than four, the, the mortality rate is similar. Now, D-dimers, similarly, mortality rate was better uh, in patients who were treated with heparin when the D-dimer level was more than six times more than the upper limit of normal. And the upper limit of normal was 0.5 in, uh, in this uh, uh, study here. The mortality rate is lower with heparin compared to non-heparin. You can see the statistical significance of p-value. And this is just uh, looking at uh, this same data visually. You can see how the difference started to uh, show after uh, uh, D-dimers increase of more than six uh, folds 
uh, and uh, also with the sepsis induced uh, coagulopathy score of more than uh, four or more than four. There's a difference in mortality in patients who were treated with heparin compared to patients who were not treated with heparin. So based on this, multiple, uh, I think I have another uh, slide that I need to show. So let me just uh, show it. Uh, and uh, I want to show this slide here. Okay, so let me go back and uh, get the laser pointer. Okay, so multiple uh, uh, bodies or organizations started to come up with different uh, uh, guidelines, if you can say, uh, or uh, guidance, uh, better uh, to say, about uh, whether we should use uh, uh, anticoagulation or not. And I think within the next few weeks, we will know more. However, what we have in our hands is probably, and from our experience, is probably enough to say that well, we need to start heparin at least for those patients at risk of coagulopathy, including the patients who are put on CRRT and ECMO. And in fact, in, in these patients, we were using much higher uh, levels of uh, or, uh, or uh, dosages of uh, anticoagulation compared to a normal situation. And then you would be questioning whether we should use anticoagulation in all patients who demonstrate signs of microthrombi induced organ dysfunction, such as respiratory failure, increased D-dimers, or uh, even acute kidney injury. You may say, well, uh, I would only use anticoagulation for documented or strongly suspected macro thromboembolism, such as pulmonary embolism or similar. Of note that some centers are the uh, therapeutically anticoagulating all patients, regardless, uh, on admission with uh, uh, when they had no absolute contraindications to anticoagulation. So this is uh, what uh, has been posted by University of Miami and uh, uh, what we're doing at uh, Rush Presbyterian Hospital is something similar, but we're uh, looking at end organ uh, uh, being the uh, hypoxemia number one, uh, elevated D-dimers more than six folds of uh, normal value or uh, acute kidney injury. Imperial College uh, recommendations uh, are even thought more aggressive. Uh, they're looking at uh, full anticoagulation starting at uh, D-dimers level of uh, 1000. That is two times uh, uh, above normal only uh, to 3000. You can see based on the uh, weight of the patient, uh, it's lower level of uh, enoxaparin 40 every 12 hours. And more than 3,000, it's full anticoagulation at full uh, dose. Uh, if, if, we were, if we would use enoxaparin, it would be 1 milligram per kg every 12 hours for those patients less than uh, 100 uh, kg. As I mentioned before, there are uh, multiple uh, studies that are ongoing at this point, and we are... Uh, uh, I don't think we're going to see the results of these studies anytime soon. It may be weeks or months. It would be probably difficult to recruit the number of patients. Two of these studies uh, uh, were not started yet, uh, and one, uh, two of studies uh, are recruiting patients at uh, this point. Again, I want to thank both uh, Dr. Abu Shala and Dr. Hawa, who participated in preparation for this uh, webinar. I just wanted to put everything together in a shorter version because the webinar took us actually more than one hour and a half. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, listening. And if you have any comments, please post it in the comment section and I will try my best to answer it. Thank you.